We are here for the third and final panel for the day. The, this panel is on international business. I'm sure most of you will agree, if not all of you, that business is international. Business has been international for a long time, but nowadays it's even a lot more so. So we have a very distinguished panel today that will be speaking with us and discussing with us on international business. And to moderate the panel, we have Alvaro Cuervo Cachura. Uh, I modeled that, but anyway, you pardon me. <laughs> and I always tell my students that I modeled their names, but I don't really apologize too much because they all model my name too. So, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I apologize for modeling your name. But Alvaro is a valued member of the DMSB uh, faculty. He's been here for a while. He's a professor of international business and the uh, Leod Money faculty fellow. His research focuses on the internationalization of firms with a, a special interest in emerging markets. He also studies capability uh, upgrading and governance challenges, especially corruption. And uh, you agree with me that corruption is a big issue in our world, and Avaro studies that. It's been published in uh, the top journals, including the uh, Organization, of Sci Organization of Science, Academy of Management Journal, Strategic Management Journal, Journal of International Business Studies. He's a fellow of the Academy of International Business and co-editor of Global Strategy Journal. So welcome, Avaro, as he introduces the other members of the panel. Thank you, Avaro. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for everybody being here. And thank you very much for everybody who is online uh, for joining us. Uh, we are going to be discussing international business. And this means we are going to be talking about companies in context and the importance of context in affecting the strategy, the management of those companies. And for that, we have a fantastic panel, uh, in-house experts uh, on many different dimensions of this uh, broad topic. Uh, why are we here? Because we are one of the top international business uh, and strategy groups in the country. Uh, we are considered uh, uh, to be among the top 10 uh, in terms of teaching international business for the US News and World Report. Uh, we are also considered to be number one in publications by uh, the UT Dallas uh, ranking. And uh, we have uh, distinguished experts uh, that have been recognized by the professional associations such as uh, fellows for the Academy of uh, International Business, Academy of Management, Association for Psychological Science, National Academy of Human Resources, Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology, and Strategic Management Society. And on top of that, uh, we have three experts uh, who have been considered among the top uh, experts in business schools in the world. So uh, what I'd like to do is go and, uh, yes, moderate this. Uh, and uh, please uh, thank uh, all the panelists and, uh, for being here, because we are going to go deep into an understanding of uh, companies in context. The way we have organized this is to go from the broader to the narrower. And we are going to start with a broad discussion of how the context affects companies, how the national and technological context affects uh, companies and uh, Ravi Ramamurti and Ravi Sarathi are going to be t taking this. Then we go into the more meso level and it's companies in reaction or uh, basically responding to uh, demands from the environment and that's where Valentina uh, Marano and Kevin Chu are going to be talking. And then we go deeper into the micro level and trying to understand how individuals basically make sense of the context, the complexities of the context and the uh, help uh, companies uh, evolve. And that's where uh, Paula Caligiuri is going to be providing the expertise. So with this, uh, let's go deep into this and let's try start with Ravi Ramamurti, who is a university distinguished professor uh, and the, the founder and the director of the Center for Emerging Markets, which is one of the leading uh, units. And I think it's the first center on emerging markets that was created. And uh, from there, we have built a lot of expertise on this topic. Rabi is an expert on emerging markets, and also he is an expert on uh, trying to understand the context and the role that uh, emerging markets have on innovation and the impact of uh, that context on companies going abroad. So please, Rabi, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you, Alvaro. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, as Alvaro said, all of my research uh, over the last uh, four or five decades has been in the context of uh, emerging markets. Uh, I came from India uh, to my uh, pursue my doctoral studies in Boston, having worked in a state-owned company for a couple of years, 
and then also before that having worked for the National uh, Planning Agency in uh, India. And when I came here, I discovered that the problems I had seen in India were also prevalent in many other developing countries. So I decided to work on that for the first decade. I'm going to break down my uh, description of my research into the four decades I've been at <laughs> Northeastern University. So the first decade was really looking at how do you improve the performance of state-owned companies in countries like India. Uh, didn't get much interest, didn't get much traction with the uh, local uh, audiences, but it was very important for the countries involved and was of some interest, I should say, to international institutions and to the countries uh, themselves. In the second decade, coincided with the time when many of these countries began to open up uh, to globalization, and they began to embrace uh, more open market uh, principles. And in that process, they ended up uh, privatizing many of their state-owned companies and deregulating and liberalizing their economies. So I followed that trend and did a, uh, for a decade, worked on those topics of how do you privatize companies, how do you liberalize and open up these uh, the industries in which they operated so as to improve the competitiveness of uh, companies uh, in those countries. By the 2000s, the effects of the economic reforms in the emerging economies in the 1990s started to manifest themselves. These countries were starting to grow at, at a fast clip. Uh, this is the decade known as the golden decade for the emerging economies. There was, uh, you know, the time when China was at blistering pace of growth. India was growing at 8%. Emerging economies as a whole were growing at about 6%. You couldn't uh, throw a stone and hit an emerging economy that wasn't growing at at least 5%. So that was the boom time for the emerging economies. And as I'll mention in a moment, that was also the decade in which we created the Center for Emerging Economies, because by then it was clear that the issues facing these countries were not just important for the countries themselves, but also for the United States. Uh, for the companies in the U.S. and companies in the other industrialized countries. By 2010, uh, we started to see a lot of innovation happening in the emerging economies. So you had companies that were globalizing on the strengths of their innovations, and that is something Alvaro talked about. You know, we, both Alvaro and I, have worked on the internationalization of companies from the emerging uh, economies. But in the 2010 onwards, I shifted some of my attention to looking at innovation in the emerging economies, innovations that would have value not just for the emerging economies, but also for the rest of the world. Uh, we call that reverse innovation, and we started to, uh, to track the extent of the uh, reverse innovations and why it was happening and what it might mean for the rest of the world. So as you can see, over this uh, four-decade period, the importance uh, of the emerging economies to, to the U.S. and to U.S. companies increased. And by uh, today, it's, it's quite obvious that these countries are very important. We all recognize the importance of countries like China and uh, India and so on. And so in that context, in 2007, we created the Center for Emerging Markets. And the idea was to really bring the context of the emerging markets into the life of the university, whether it was in research or what we taught our students or how we engaged with companies. And I think we had some had some uh, significant success in that direction over the last 15 years. We have now 60 faculty associates of the center. About half of them are from the Damore McKim School of Business across different parts of the school. The other half are from the rest of the university. And we have a very distinguished uh, advisory board consisting of CXOs of companies from both the emerging economies and the developed uh, countries. And we've started to raise some funding uh, to put the center, I think, on a solid footing going, going forward. Now, what is the outlook for the emerging economies looking, uh, looking ahead? In a nutshell, I would say that we are in the second or third inning of the story of the rise of the emerging economies. We have only seen the beginning of this process. It's going to unfold over many decades. And so I think the issues that we address in the Center for Emerging Markets and in our own research in that context are going to be important for many, many years uh, to come. Uh, the importance in terms of innovation, I think, is also going to uh, increase. Uh, today, we have innovations coming out of the emerging markets in areas like artificial intelligence, uh, electric vehicles, batteries, re renewable energy, solar, wind, 
uh, many of the leading firms in these industries and many of the innovations in these industries are coming from the emerging uh, economies. So stepping back, as you look at the opportunities for us in terms of research, I think there are enormous opportunities. And I think the, even as the world has changed to make emerging economies more important, moving them from the periphery to the center, I think we're also, also seeing uh, the university's strategy and the new academic plan aligning very nicely with some of the things that we do. The university wants to be global. I mean, how can you be global if you don't pay attention to 85% of the world's population? You know, seven of the eight billion people live in the emerging economies. So it's going to be important. And for any of the vertical research areas we talk about, whether it's security or healthcare or uh, sustainability, the emerging economies are going to be an important source of the problem, an important uh, part of the solution to any of those global issues. So I think I invite uh, all my colleagues at the school, if you're not already a part of the center, to please, whatever your work is, chances are it has something to do with emerging economies, and there is something you can learn from there and bring back to the US. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. A fantastic introduction to the importance of emerging markets and the transformation of emerging markets and our understanding of these important countries over time and how this is not something that past, but it's going to continue influencing how we do research. And of course, the practice that uh, managers are going to basically uh, be implementing. With that, let's move to, uh, to Ravi Sarathi, who is uh, a professor of international business and strategy and our in-house expert on digital strategies. So anything that you need to know about it, uh, this is a person you should be considering. Uh, he has been um, working on the role of digital uh, technologies in changing the strategies, industries, and cross-border investments. And uh, I think that we are going to have uh, a really good discussion on this. Ravi? Uh, thank you, Alvaro. Uh, my interest uh, the last few years has been on how uh, companies, can, companies and governments, uh, the macroeconomic system, can use the growing uh, capability of uh, digitization to conduct strategy better. Uh, my particular interest in the last few years has been blockchain, which is also known as uh, distributed ledger technology. Now, if you think about international business, one of the hardest things about international business is coordination. You have uh, companies with suppliers, with markets, uh, having to negotiate with partners, with governments and multilateral institutions. And all of this has to be done continuously uh, across borders. And so there's a huge coordination job here, and that's very difficult. So blockchain, uh, in a sense, allows you to think about how to do this coordination uh, smoother, uh, more accurately, with less disputes, and in real time. Uh, there's an idea in blockchain called decentralized autonomous organizations, which suggests that if you create a decentralized network, you don't have to have hierarchy. You don't have to have the typical multinational structure with the headquarters and then branches and then uh, lower tier suppliers and then relationships with distributors, with customers, etc. And so there's a lot of promise here in terms of how you can use this idea of decentralized autonomous organizations to structure multinationals. But the problem is it requires a whole change in organizational culture, something that my colleague Paula knows a lot about. Because Companies around the world, whether it's an American company or Japanese or Chinese or Indian, believe in hierarchy, believe in top-down uh, dictation to some extent of strategy and direction. So <coughs> implementing DAO, decentralized autonomous organizations, using blockchain is very hard because it requires a company to give up a certain degree of control and become much more willing to become part of a decentralized autonomous organization. Now, if you think of some of the friction points in international business. One of the biggest ones is cross-border remittances. Almost any international transaction at the end of the day requires transfer of uh, funds across borders, which means you need to involve banks, correspondent banking networks, uh, exchange rates, fluctuations in exchange rates, hedging, uh, uncertainty, volatility, lack of transparency, high costs. And blockchain, and particularly cryptocurrencies, allow you to start doing cross-border remittances most smoothly, much faster, much more transparently, and at significantly lower cost. Uh, there is a company called Ripple, for example, with a currency called XRP, which has been 
pioneering in the space, trying to uh, allow companies to become part of RippleNet, use XRP to be able to send money back and forth. But it is a private company. It is for profit. And there's a lot of questions about XRP itself as being uh, subject to lawsuits from the SEC and being rather volatile. And so can it become the basis of any kind of new cross-border remittance regime? This is where central bank digital currencies come in. Governments around the world have been waking up to the fact that cross-country, uh, cross-border remittances are a problem and there are, there are private market solutions emerging and that some of these solutions do have some risk to the global financial system. So governments from Europe, from Japan, from China, from India, uh, just about anyway, including the US, have been experimenting with creating government-sponsored fiat currencies that are entirely digital, known as central bank digital currencies. And the idea would be that you and I would be able to convert our bank accounts into these digital currencies and then exchange them across borders. And there'd be no question about the value of these currencies, unlike cryptocurrencies, which are very volatile, because these are supported by central banks. However, the biggest problem there is that there's a fear that the government would then have a complete visibility and window into all of our economic transactions. So as you can imagine, politically, it is somewhat controversial, particularly in the US, where you have much more polarization perhaps than in other countries. But I will say that something like 80 central banks around the world are experimenting with central bank digital currencies. China has at least 20 cities in which citizens are allowed to convert some of their uh, yuan into digital yuan and then use them for payments. And I think it's inevitable that this is going to happen. And then finally, there's a geopolitical implication that the US dollar has been the basis of the world's global financial system since the Second World War. And so 85% or more of financial transactions around the world are denominated in dollars, which gives the US a huge financial advantage because people are willing to hold US dollars everywhere in the world. So if you create money supply, some of it is going to leak from the country and be held by others, which allows you to create money supply at a faster rate than perhaps the US economy might justify. Countries like Russia, which don't like sanctions, Iran, uh, Cuba, North Korea, all the countries that are somewhat inimical to American interests would love to break up the dollar monopoly and instead move to a global digital currency, which would not be subject to US monopoly. And then more broadly, aside from the fact that you might be able to reduce the, the, the domination of the US in global financial markets, there is the fact that the blockchain and cryptocurrencies are trying to create an alternative financial system. As you may have seen in recent weeks, uh, the collapse of uh, Credit Suisse, one of the biggest banks in the world, is now no longer. It's been merged for pennies on the dollar with UBS. The collapse of Silicon Valley Bank here in the US, uh, the precariousness of, uh, of uh, uh, what is it called, First Republic Bank. So there is a, you know, this happened in 2008, which is why Bitcoin was created. Bitcoin was created in 2009 as a libertarian response to the fact that you had highly centralized Federal Reserve banks around the world controlling the global financial system. And the idea was you can't trust the government. We have to do it on our own. So Bitcoin was created as an alternative financial system. Today, 12, 13 years later, we have the same collapse happening. And so all the Bitcoin evangelists are saying, see, we told you, don't trust governments, come to us. So going forward, if you think of international business, which is not just companies, but also governments and multilateral institutions, there's a whole question of what is the global financial system going to look like? And so for me, it's one of the most fascinating fields in the world of international business, trying to understand how the international financial system will evolve and whether you can have coexistence between private currencies and fiat currencies. So I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, fantastic overview of the importance of uh, digital technologies uh, for the coordination across borders and then deeper into the story of uh, digital advances in fintech and uh, what happens with uh, uh, blockchain and uh, this type of currencies and how that plays a role into not only, yes, some uh, students trading on the side, but also basically <laughs> what happens at the country level and the geopolitical implications of uh, digital technologies. So let's now move into the world of um, sustainability. And for that, we have Valentina Marano, who is an associate professor uh, in the group, uh, who is our expert on uh, corporate social responsibility and uh, corporate governance, and she's going to be talking about uh, the role of multinationals here as uh, change agents within the globe. Valentina, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Alvaro, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, so as Alvaro said, in, in my research, I focus on the role of multinational corporations as uh, basically problem solvers uh, when it comes to key environmental and social issues of our time. Think of the consequences of human-induced climate change uh, or the persistent gender gap within organizations. Um, and I focus on multinational corporations because uh, their size, geographic scope, and influence make them potentially very effective actors for tackling these issues, often in collaboration with, with other uh, societal or governmental actors. So in this context, I would like to highlight key findings from some of my research on um, uh, multinational corporations, sustainability reporting, and on the role of uh, gender diversity within corporate boards across countries. On the first topic, my research shows that sustainability disclosures have basically become a global norm for multinational corporations worldwide because uh, this kind of practice helps companies uh, gain legitimacy with key societal and regulatory actors. Um, sustainability reporting is also particularly important for emerging market multinationals uh, because it can really help them overcome what we refer to as these um, basically liabilities of origins, which are these negative attributions that certain societal and regulatory actors based in ad more advanced economies may hold against them because of some of the institutional weaknesses that are found in their home countries. However, uh, for emerging market multinationals, it may be actually particularly difficult to walk their sustainability talk, often because they tend to be somewhat new uh, to these kinds of practices. And so my research suggests that to walk their sustainability talk, emerging market multinationals uh, should try to, uh, at times, learn quickly the best practices in this area. And a good strategy for achieving this outcome uh, would entail, for example, expanding to those foreign markets where sustainability practices are more established. As for my research on gender within organizations, uh, I have focused on the role of women directors vis-a-vis -vis their company's social and environmental performance. And my research shows that the effect that women directors have on corporate outcomes in this area is actually consistently positive across countries. So since women remain uh, severely underrepresented on corporate boards worldwide, increasing the representation on boards uh, may actually turn into an important source of competitive advantage for companies that may decide to do so. In addition, my research also shows that the ability of women directors to affect impact in these important areas of corporate behavior is affected by the culture of their home countries. Um, therefore, um, in those countries that have less supportive cultures vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, female leadership within organizations, uh, those companies that are really serious about wanting to affect change um, in the social and environmental arena may need to recognize these cultural biases explicitly and take action to, to counter them. Uh, this might entail designing practices that are aimed at strengthening the quality of board's communication efforts, collaborative behaviors, uh, in less supportive cultural environments, um, these kind of change management practices may be necessary, although not always sufficient, to overcome existing cultural obstacles uh, that limit companies' ability to really capitalize on their women directors' distinctive traits, knowledge, and expertise. Uh, in my current work, I'm bringing basically my expertise in sustainability and governance broadly defined to the world of practice. Uh, there is a certain amount of interest in these topics. I expect to continue uh, to, to, to be so. Um, and I'm working with a multi-stakeholder initiative that is based in Europe uh, that is trying to help leading global multinationals basically act as orchestrators uh, for the diffusion of sustainability practices in their global supply chains, uh, which remains an area of uh, particular challenge uh, for many of these global actors and risk. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Really nice discussion of uh, change agents, uh, both multinationals uh, in how we are thinking about sustainability and also within companies how uh, women can basically play this role of change agents and push uh, companies towards, if you want, uh, uh, better um, outcomes. So let's now move uh, to Kevin Chua, who is an assistant professor, and uh, we are very happy that uh, he joined recently our group. Uh, he is our uh, expert on uh, environmental sustainability and responsible investment, and uh, he will be talking about uh, the importance of climate change, uh, how this is playing a role in uh, uh, companies. And 
what is happening with uh, stakeholders' expectations in regards to this. Kevin, Great. Thanks a lot, Alvaro, and I'm very happy to be here as well. Thanks uh, for everyone uh, for, for joining us today. Uh, so my research is on shareholder activism. Uh, so specifically, I'm looking at how investors try to influence and encourage uh, companies to become more sustainable, uh, especially around environmental uh, and uh, environmental issues and in relation to climate change. My background is I actually was an investor for over a decade, so I've been on that side of the fence. I've seen what some of them do, some of them don't do, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, since I left the industry, I'm actually an activist as well um, in, my, in my spare time. Uh, so I'm actually working with a lot of activists in this space to actually see what tactics they're using, what tactics can work, and what actually um, is effective for getting these companies to change. So I'm trying to help them understand how they actually can do their engagements and their activism uh, better. So one example of a group that I've been collaborating with uh, in my research uh, is an initiative called um, Climate Action 100 Plus. So this is a group of about 700 of the world's largest investors. Uh, so collectively they manage around $60 trillion in assets, so that's a, that's a lot of money. Uh, these investors include pension funds, mutual funds that manage money on our behalf, but it also includes groups uh, like non-profits, university endowments, and also uh, motivated individuals. And so as part of this initiative, they've identified the 166 largest, uh, largest companies in the world that are responsible or accountable for over 80% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Right, so this includes all the oil majors, um, large manufacturing firms, um, and the like. Many of many of you that uh, are a part of our daily life, many which are a part of our daily lives. And what they're doing is they're speaking to the management of these companies, trying to encourage them to think of ways to actually reduce uh, their carbon uh, footprint. So that includes encouraging them to yes, increase their disclosure and their reporting. That's very important. But I think more important then is actually getting these companies to set very specific time-bound targets to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and then from that step to think about, well, how do we go from those targets to actually implementing that within our business models, within our actual strategies? How do we change the capital, um, our capital allocation and capital expenditure uh, across our businesses? How do we develop products uh, which are less carbon intensive. Uh, so these are the sorts of things that these investors um, are really focused on. And so it's, you know, I love doing this research because it's a mixture of, yes, it's a very important phenomenon, but also something that I'm deeply involved in. So why then, okay, I'm viewing it from the activist perspective, why then is it actually important for businesses that are being targeted? <laughs> well, first of all, many of these investors are businesses themselves, fine, but the businesses themselves I'd say there's three key things that really matter to them. One is that we talk a lot about shareholder primacy, that companies need to manage their companies on behalf of shareholders. Well, these are 700 large shareholders who really care about climate, right? So these executives uh, take note of these sorts of issues. Secondly, is that regulation is coming, right? It, it, already, is, it already exists in many countries. You see this... Um, actually in many emerging markets that have been ahead of the curve there, um, but also um, obviously in Europe. And we're going to get a raft of regulation coming um, in the US uh, this year and next year. So companies can choose to either be reactive to that and be on the back foot and see what the competitors do. Or with the blessing of their investors, with the, in, with the blessing of their shareholders, they can be proactive and actually use this toward, uh, as part of their competitive advantage. And then I'd say the third group that this really matters for in terms of the cut for, for these businesses is their stakeholders. So customers uh, do tend to prefer companies that provide, pro provide solutions uh, to these problems or develop products that are less um, uh, impactful on the environment in a harmful way. But also employees and the leaders of the future of these companies want to work for companies that are environmentally sustainable. So I'll just finish on one anecdote, which is actually from um, my teaching. Uh, I teach the um, sophomore, sophomore cl uh, course, um, Business Decision Making in Developed Countries. Uh, and as part of that, our students, uh, the students that I teach, 
have the choice of, uh, of topic uh, to investigate deeper um, when it comes to a company. And for those group assignments, over half of the students choose environmental sustainability, right? And these are the leaders of the future, right? And they want to work for companies that take these issues seriously. So if companies want to have happy employees, maintain competitive advantage, then they're going to have to take this really seriously. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave that for the moment and happy to answer any questions. On Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a great introduction to another source of change agent, uh, shareholders that we tend to, in some cases, not always think as uh, the leaders in uh, environmental sustainability, but nevertheless, uh, this is one of the biggest transformations that is happening in recent times. So with this, let's now move to Paula Caligiuri, uh, who is a distinguished professor uh, in the group, and uh, she's our expert on uh, cultural agility and uh, um, global leadership. And she's the one who's going to bring everything down to the world of managers <laughs> and individuals. Or just and bring how everything down. They can deal with all the complexity that we have been discussing. Hola, call it yours, please. Thanks, Alvaro. I have really impressive colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing amazing things, uh, clearly, very complex topics, very challenging issues that we're all working in and working on. Um, my friends, international business is, is challenging. It's messy, right? It's, the, it's, that, it's that phrase coined by the military. It's VUCA. It's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Um, I'm a psychologist. I study the people who have to operate in volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And it's not everyone who can do that. It's not everyone who can do that. We need individuals who have cultural agility, agility to be able to manage in and through all of these incredible issues that were just described. Um, cultural agility is the ability to comfortably and effectively work in different countries and with people from different cultures and different backgrounds. We have many different cultures represented here. I would argue that as a panel, we have one culture represented <laughs> here, right? We have different generations, different professions, different lenses, different socioeconomic status, gender. I mean, there's so many dimensions on which we can layer and call it culture. Um, so, so people who are really good at this, people who can really navigate in and out of cultural differences, they tend to be individuals who have this this beautiful recipe of nurture and nature. The nurture side of it, I'm going to be will I'm willing to bet almost all of you have experienced at some point, and that's the opportunity to live abroad, work abroad, study abroad, spend some time uh, in different countries and different cultures. That's a really pivotal experience, right? That that experience. If I had to, if we had to go around and say what was one of the top things that happened in your life that changed your life, you'd probably would have pointed. You probably would have pointed to that international experience, right? But it's not enough. I wish it were. Here at Northeastern, we're a global university, and that's one of the reasons I was attracted to coming here. But it's not enough. I wish it was as simple as picking people up and putting them in another country, leaving them there for some amount of time. And then poof, they become culturally agile and able to handle all of these incredibly complex topics. It's not that easy, my friends. I wish it were. It's not. It's what happens while they're there. That's the nurture part. It's their ability to change and, and, and to accept and understand and have the humility to say, I don't really know how things are done here. I could be brilliant in accounting or finance or strategy or journalism or medicine, but I don't know how to do that here. The moment we give you know, ourselves to the context is the moment we start to spend a little more time asking questions, getting curious, building relationships in order to be effective. And that's the nurture side. There's also a nature side to this. And I promised my friends I would not talk about 
the dopamine and serotonin necessary for humans to, but let's talk about it for a second. So we are all born with, <laughs> you know, some genetic markers that make us able to handle ambiguity at a higher level. Some of our, some of us just gravitate toward, you know, jumping off of, out of airplanes and bungee jumping and all that other good stuff. You probably have, you handle dopamine in a certain way. We don't all do it that way, of course. Um, so for some of us, we have dispositions that we need to spend a little bit more time um, building and gaining and the like. So uh, it's both. It's nurture and nature. Um, we do those both here at Northeastern. We spend a lot of time in our IB program. In fact, an entire course dedicated to helping people build that self-awareness around those critical competencies, enabling them to grow those competencies so that they're ready for any complex, uncertain, uh, ambiguous situation that they're in. It's, it's been incredibly rewarding. Uh, I will say, as I conclude, that the thing that's, well, it's not exactly keeping me up at night, but I think an issue that we're all facing is with the world going so virtual, it's how do we make sure we still give our students, still give our, our colleagues, and still have for ourselves an opportunity uh, to build this competency, to build cultural agility um, when we're not necessarily in the same environment. So it's an exciting time. I'm looking forward to it. And, and, and I'm just going to do one quick plug as I have about four seconds left. Everybody here is doing such great research, and we have lots of colleagues uh, around our school that's doing, they're all doing fantastic research. The International Business and Strategy Group um, we started a podcast called International Business Today. Really, take out your phone, type in International Business Today. It'll pop up. It's a great podcast. Lots of the folks you heard on, on all of the panels today are profiled with more to come. So with that, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful introduction to at the level of the individual, how do we deal with the complexity that basically happens in international business. So with this, uh, this is an example of uh, what the group does. Uh, this is an example of the expertise we have uh, built uh, from the context, understanding nations, understanding technologies, to then understanding the role of multinational investors, to then understanding how individuals basically deal with complexity. So now it's time to have a conversation. And that's what we like to do. Uh, so please, for those of you who are online, uh, it will be great if you can type your questions. Uh, in the chat, uh, for those of you who are here, uh, we are more than happy to have a, an open mic discussion. So, Thank you all. Uh, this is a wonderful panel. Thank you so much. Um, I, I got a question particularly for, for you, but um, across the board, please uh, appreciate you the or you, you. expertise. Uh, Ken. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, I, I guess uh, you've been talking about the, the uh, pressure markers for ESG from investors and shareholders who are themselves pushed by their own constituencies. Uh, we have seen more political backlash in the U.S. more recently. Uh, and I run a startup, and I always like try to like struggle with how to deal with these societal issues and all that stuff uh, while running a company. Uh, how, how should companies think about kind of the, them being squeezed between these two sides? I mean, is, is, that, is that a thing? Is that a real thing? Or, and and how, how should companies think about that? It's, it's really tough. It's, uh, it's, it's complex, uh, something that we've talked about today. And companies are grappling with that as we speak. So. Some uh, are aware that a key part of the constituency really cares about these issues. Uh, others, uh, others who are also important to their constituency are at the complete opposite end of that spectrum. I think how companies have tried to deal with that is to almost take a step back and say, well, what actually makes business sense here? And that's when, okay, for some that might not be a pleasant stepping off point. Right, that they will alienate some of their um, some constituents because of that. But when they take that lens of what actually makes business sense, and especially when it comes to climate change, they'll realise that well, our business is being affected by wildfires, hurricanes, and 
um, and, um, and floods. They'll realise that, yes, our employees do care about this, most of our customers care about this, and even if none of that was true, the regulator is going to make us care, for it, care about it. Right? So I think once they think and take that step back and think a bit more at that higher level, they'll realise, well, we have to do this whether we like it or not. And maybe I can add something yeah, to that. Um, I, I, I see we are living at a time where uh, certain expectations are being normalized. Um, expectations around corporations taking a, a stance on important social and environmental issues. We're seeing so much more of that. And um, I, I look at this, another problem that companies have to tackle is in this normalization of ESG. Um, there seems to be also a lot of opportunities for um, companies doing what's, what makes business sense, but um, maybe over embellishing or maybe not being so serious about um, you know, the, the, the core values associated with these kind of corporate behaviors. And so I think that uh, it, it's, it's going to be also challenging to tell apart right, um, the good actors from the not so good actors, the issue of greenwashing is definitely present. Uh, so it's, it's uh, as a student of, of these trends, for me, this is a very interesting time. But I think the issue of the business case for sustainability is, is definitely very much alive and kicking in. We, uh, the Center for Emerging Markets recently hosted a, a fantastic talk uh, with uh, Honeywell uh, president. And he was making the strong point, Ravi, I mean, about how when you look at sustainability, opportunities, right, for growth, there's real opportunity for growth uh, in the sustainability era in emerging markets, and Honeywell is doing it because some key leaders clearly care about these issues, but also because it makes real good business sense. Right. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, if I can add to that, I think there's another interesting issue, which is how much can the market, in terms of carbon taxes, force companies to start thinking, even if they're not committed from a, from a you know, social yeah. uh, perspective, right? And to me, uh, a good market is necessary in addition to regulation. The starting point is each country regulates the extent of emissions and imposes a tax. Then comes the possibility of an efficient market functioning globally that allows companies to buy and trade uh, carbon credits. And one of the things, practically speaking, that's really hard is verifying these carbon credits. That's probably one of the biggest problems. If without verifiable carbon credits, the market fails. The price is meaningless, and therefore the carbon credit regime falls. And I was talking earlier about blockchain, and one of the interesting developments is how can we use blockchain as a way of creating a carbon credit market, including verifiable carbon credits, so that the first step is putting the carbon credit, verified carbon credit as a token into the, into the blockchain uh, system. And once it's done, it becomes very transparent after that. Any trades, uh, any transition of ownership, who it's been used for, what has it been applied against, and actually showing that it is working. So I don't know, but Kevin, if, you know, in addition to activism, you would agree that the other side of the coin is you absolutely do need market forces. It's, you can't just rely on the goodness of people and the goodness of politicians to make these changes happen. We know 1.5 is not going to be met, so how's, how's the, you know, what are we going to do? And I think one answer is rely on markets and regulation. Both, both need to be happening. Thank you. Since we have strayed from uh, Karthik's original okay. question, so let me continue to stray <laughs> and, and, and say how the emerging <coughs> markets can actually help address some of these uh, issues. Because I think it's a, we have an interesting paradox with the emerging economies, which is that if you take a country like China, it is on the one hand uh, the largest polluter, uh, I mean, not adjusting for the population, but just the absolute <coughs> amount of uh, emissions, but at the same time is also one of the largest users of renewable energy. So you have this a contradiction in some sense. And it reflects the fact that because the emerging economies have been late to industrialize, they could leapfrog and adopt, you know, uh, so the leaders in wind and solar energy application are in fact countries like China and uh, India. Uh, China produces three times as much uh, solar energy uh, from solar power, that is, than the U.S., even though it's also, also still a very large uh, polluter. So 
I think what they are trying to do is to learn from the experience of the developed countries. And because they're still growing and it's still adding capacity, they can't, they don't have to wait for replacing capacity in order to go to, to green sources of energy. They can add a lot of green capacity uh, in the process. Now, the flip side of that is, of course, 85% of all the solar panels in the world are coming out of China. And this is a national security risk for many countries trying to go down that path. And China controls vital technologies relating to solar uh, power, to the actual production of the uh, solar panels and the components that go into it, and might use that as leverage, just as the U.S. is now trying to apply leverage on China and hold back technologies relating to semiconductors. They have the opportunity to do that with respect to uh, EV batteries, uh, they have the opportunity to do that with respect to solar uh, energy as well. But I know we've gone a long way from your question. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> no, but I think this is important. I'd like to bring this at a de different level. So we have been exploring what happens with the environmental side, what happens with sustainability, climate change, how do we think about it. Let's bring another big topic, uh, geopolitics. Governments, government interactions, uh, conflicts, collaboration across borders. Uh, what do you see? How do you see this playing a role in your particular area of expertise? How do we have to think differently from the way we thought before? Uh, where do we go with this? And what can managers basically uh, do about it? So who would like to start? Uh, <coughs> Obviously, this is something that uh, <laughs> the emerging economies are a very big part of this attention. China is one of those countries that is at the center of this uh, challenge. Uh, you know, we used to talk of the, about the G6, G7. Today, we talk of G20. And the G20, what are the other 13 countries? They're all emerging uh, economies. And this year, India is chairing the G20. Last year, Indonesia was chairing the G20. So we're starting to see some changes within the global power structure. Uh, but we have not had this particular context before, where you have a country like China, which is the number two economy in the world, uh, which still per capita income is one uh, fifth that of the US. So it's not really a completely a developed uh, uh, country. It has a very different polit political system from what we have in uh, some of the other key economies. So the, we, the, China would like to reshape the global architecture. The US would like to continue to preserve the existing architecture. And we live in an interdependent world. So we don't know how to get from here to there. As someone said, it's like trying to fix the engine of a plane, even as you're flying the plane. So we are, we are very highly interdependent and connected, but we want to reconfigure it, both countries the U.S. and China would like to reconfirm it in different ways. So I think we are entering a period of uh, uh, much more un uncertainty to go back to VUCA. <laughs> VUCA on steroids, I think, is what we're, uh, we're looking at. And a more general point, I think, and I say this to my students, is that I was lucky to be born when I was because I lived through the golden decades of the global economy. Really, there was fantastic years looking back they are not going to be so fortunate. They're going to live through much more volatile times. Growth is going to be slower. Geopolitical conflicts are going to be more intense. And we haven't fully seen the US-China uh, tensions play out. And we certainly haven't seen the full impact of climate change play out. And then there's technology with AI and all of that. We're not quite sure what all of that might mean uh, for the world. So I think uh, we, we're entering a turbulent uh, period in which uh, the inequality issues will also get more pronounced. So overall, I mean, I tell students to be mindful of the, uh, not, not to assume that uh, what worked before will work in the future. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure my colleagues must also have some thoughts on this issue. I think someone has a question. I actually. Oh, OK. So, OK. Does anybody want to take, continue? I did have a thought on, okay. on, on, on this issue of government role and in, in, in multinationals um, basically living in this era of heightened change and going back to something Ravi was saying before, of course there's, there's room for the marketing playing a very important role in shaping companies' strategies and 
pushing them to do the right thing. But I continue to see the role of government in sustainability as very, very important. If you look specifically at uh, certain government initiatives in Europe around quotas, gender quotas on boards, we see that the countries that have enacted those more stringent gender quotas have actually had significant improvements in terms of uh, diversity representation. And, and so I think when you look at these realities from the point of view of a manager of a multinational company that operates in, in parts of the world that move at different speed in these areas of important social and environmental change, that flexibility that Paula was talking about is key because you're going to have to develop sustainability strategies that speak to this complexity, right, that you're faced within these specific areas, different roles of government, this, different levels of activism coming from the government, different societal stakeholders. Um, so I, I, I think it's good that the government is playing a positive, and not just in Europe, we're, we're seeing this, for example, in, in India, um, in Israel, and, and, and it's an important development, but yet another element of complexity for managers uh, that, that look at these issues from a uh, sort of with a global point of view. Excellent. Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, a question, Ravi Ramamurti, or maybe others. That, uh, for those of us that don't study uh, emerging markets, it would appear to me the last 10 years has not been very kind for um, democratic institutions in emerging markets. But you've been studying this for four decades. So I'm hoping you'll tell me that it's a much better picture than what I see in the <laughs> short term. But I'm wondering about your, your thoughts of what you see from your uh, four decades of studying this area. Well, this is not exactly my field of uh, research. So I should be careful I don't uh, put my foot in my mouth. But I think we saw uh, a period in which the flourishing of markets and democracy, right? There was a, a period in which many countries were moving in that direction. Uh, and then China stepped up and said, there is another way to do it, which is our way, which is not necessarily democratic in the sense of the Western democracies. We have our own kind of internal democracy within the party and so on. And a strong uh, visible hand of the state working with the invisible hand of the market is a better formula than simply leaving everything to the invisible hand of the market. Uh, and that has, I think, gained some strength in, in the recent years. Um, we saw some uh, tendencies in that direction in the US, too. Uh, and the US has been a bulwark against preventing that kind of a drift. Uh, and so I think that has been a bit of a setback as well. So. It is, again, if you wanted to add it to the mix of re reasons to be concerned about the future, I think that is one of the other sources of, uh, of risk. I do think a world in which uh, markets are allowed to operate, but is also counterbalanced by democratic forces, so that every individual has one vote. Because in the market, every dollar has one vote. But in the political uh, process, every individual has one vote. And that's how you ma maintain some balance between the logic of the market with the logic of society. Uh, I think it's actually a very powerful combination. And one of the great gifts of the US to the whole world after the end of the Second World War. And that model flourished and almost looked as if everybody was going to go in that direction. But now we are retreating. So I think it's, it's cause for concern. Mm -hmm. yeah. Please go ahead. I guess a related question, freedom of expression is under attack in this country, and we know it's uh, limited in, in China, where many multinationals uh, want to wanna sell products. And uh, I'm wondering what you see as the role of multinationals engaging with the, that issue in China. Um, I had the experience of having a fashion executive who was going to speak on a a panel about human rights in the supply chain, and uh, they canceled once uh, their uh, event got through compliance. And so I've seen multinationals just avoid uh, the issue, and I'm wondering either what advice you would want to give them or what role you see that they, they actually have in that uh, area. Who wants to take this? 
<laughs> well, don't be shy. It is. It is. It, it's. It certainly is an issue, and you know we have other global supply chain experts in the room um, <laughs> who could help us out here. But um, you know we we are seeing tremendous uh, pressures, right? Um, not just within the traditional. Uh, multinational intra-firm network, uh, but also the broader uh, supply chain network, uh, which, uh, you know, we've seen pressures for multinationals to do the right thing. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's tough. It's, it's, it's tough to, to, to always do the right thing in terms of, um, you know, what societal expectations, stakeholders' expectations are. Um, versus, you know, uh, taking the line of, okay, we, we need to protect our ability to continue to do business here. But we've seen, you know, a number of companies actually going out and being very much activist in, in the way they reacted to what's been happening in Ukraine. We're not talking about China, uh, but what's happening in, in, in Ukraine and sort of the, the mass exodus uh, from from Russia as a result of, of those events, multinational. It, it's, of course, you know, that story is also goes hand in hand with the fact that a number of companies decided to stick around and sort of see how things went. So it's clearly complicated. I think that in my experience, my own reading, my own understanding and talking about these issues um, really it's about what the company sees itself. It's about its identity, its values, um, and you're going to see companies doing taking very different routes, um, and understandably so. Um, but I mean, I, and, and again, once you then expand the line of thinking even outside of the intrafirm network to the global supply chain, then those touch points become that more complex, abundant, and 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 hard to manage. I don't know if. Some of my other colleagues want to join yeah, well, in, but I, I'm not very optimistic that multinationals will help solve those kinds of issues. <laughs> uh, I think they are, as you said, as the example you mentioned, they like to keep their head down and uh, not get in the middle of these controversies. Uh, unless their consumers are put pressure on them, then that is, you have the activism of the consumers saying, Sweatshops are not okay, so then they back off and don't don't do that. Or if there's you no know, slave labor somewhere, uh, so the consumer is a force. The shareholders and the activists are sometimes a force, but they have to affect the bottom line before they really get serious about uh, responding. With regard to China, China was very good at playing companies one off against the other. Right, so this one company is more compliant. This will give you the access to the market in exchange for uh, giving us the technology and, and so on. Uh, and they never could unify and take a unified position against together. They might have been able to succeed if they could all come together, but that's a different level of activism on their part, right? To engage in that kind of uh, uh, even governments were afraid to take on China, right? So it took some time even for that to come to the, uh, to, to the fore. So I, I wouldn't put my money on multinational corporations helping to straighten out the ills of the world. <laughs> um, they can help. If they are not uh, going to help, is there in the political area, is there an area in which they can basically be the leaders? Who will like to take this? Well, you know, I think part of the problem is we all like cheap stuff. We like reasonably well-made cheap stuff. <laughs> China is the biggest source of that well-made cheap stuff. So until consumers around the world start balancing the desire for cheap stuff with other values, it's not going to change. So the change can't come from governments, I don't think. It can't come from multinationals. It has to come from consumers. We have to be a little bit more conscious of what do we want? You know, are we happy? kind of putting on blinders and not thinking about what's happening in other parts of the world as long as, you know, I've got mine. Uh, and I think that's a major conversation mm -hmm. uh, to have. And uh, I don't know if you agree. Yeah, I'm going to push back just slightly on okay. that. Yeah. And that. I don't think you can all be... And I'm not, you're not saying it's all on consumers, but I understand the role of consumers. But also, um, in an age where the cost of living is, very, is getting very, very difficult for many, many people, Mm -hmm. uh, it's also incumbent on companies to and 
and governance to enforce this to make sure that workers are getting paid fairly, right? Mm -hmm. And that workers are able to become responsible consumers that can really exercise this choice because if I'm earning minimum wage in many countries, mm -hmm. I understand why people have to consume uh, or can only afford to consume things that are poorly produced or produced in countries with, um, with questionable human rights um, practices. So that's maybe one way that multinationals can support this and effectively support themselves as well mm -hmm. if I'm making sure that, yes, we're making sure that our workplaces are good places um, for, for employees to be productive, to have lasting relationships with their employers, and then to become really good consumers as well. I totally agree with you on that. I think the problem is stakeholders and who balances stakeholder rights. And employees are a stakeholder, and it's very easy to go to the gig, gig economy and say, I don't have to pay benefits, I don't have to give you vacation, so let's try to protect legislation uh, that allows us to work that way. And so that's exactly what you're talking about, I think, and we both agree then. Yeah. If we had a fairer system, we wouldn't need to be looking for cheap mm. stuff. I think that's mm. what your point is, right? I agree, yeah. So with that, uh, I'd like to close. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so let's go deep into, yes, the complexity of international business, how that affects companies, and of course the tensions that that creates in terms of uh, whether we are going for the efficiency and the lowest cost possible or whether we have to take into account the complexity and changes in expectations from uh, consumers, from governments, from uh, stakeholders. And this is one of the tensions which provides a fantastic ground for basically trying to understand uh, better how companies can be run to create both value for society and also capture some of that value. So with this, uh, thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Thank you very much, everybody online, for uh, joining us. Uh, I'd like to encourage everybody to continue the conversation and visit the website of International Business and Strategy Group uh, to follow the events at the Center for Emerging Markets and, of course, to follow the podcast of International Business Today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.